I'm going to talk about lots of things this morning. Um, yesterday morning's keynote um, uh, was interesting. We, um, the stuff about history. We have we have much to learn from history, um, obviously. Um, my favourite historian, this guy called Tony Jutt, um, he wrote that um, the past is not empty. It's got stuff in it. Um, you can't just wander around pretending it's not there because you'll bump into the furniture and hurt yourself. Um, he also wrote that um, arguing about history was like uh, yelling at football on the television. Um, they can't hear you, they don't care, and it doesn't make any difference anyway. Um, I prefer yelling at the present. Um, that's, what I, that's what I tend to do my shouting at. Um, we can only use those lessons from history, which are, which are fantastically important, but we can only use them if we, if we understand when to apply them, if we understand the, the landscape of the present in which those strategies could be employed. And, and I frequently get the feeling that we, let alone you know, trying to understand the future, we have almost no idea what's going on right now. Uh, we live in a world that's, um, that's deeply complex, that's structurally complex, that's intentionally complex, uh, and apparently incoherent, um, that, that produces constant strange uh, cognitive dissonances, strange... Um, combinations of events that appear to be uh, you know, only tangentially or, or very deeply interrelated in, in ways that we can't entirely tell, that we feel intuitively must be rela related to things that we're doing, but we can't see them. Uh, the scope of these actions has become so large, so vast, um, so, so global and so interconnected that, um, that, it, that it eludes kind of individual view, whether it's kind of financial markets um, or whether it's kind of the rule of law and, and human actions or, or, or interactions with technology. Uh, they span such vast areas, we can, we can barely fit them into a single mind. That's the world we live in. Uh, we need new strategies in order to deal with that. I'm going to talk a bit about those today. Um, this is a tesseract. Uh, it's one of my favorite symbols for this kind of thing. Um, it was a structure named by the Victorian British mathematician James Hinton. Here's some history. Um, it's a representation of a four-dimensional object in three-dimensional space. Um, and, and the thing about the Tesseract is also what it shows us is that four-dimensional objects will cast stable shadows down into the dimension beneath them. In this, in this case, it's a three-dimensional object, two-dimensional shadow, but four-dimensional objects also cast stable shadows into the third dimension, which means that we can read these complex structures if we know exactly where to look for them but their full structure remains entirely invisible to us, as so much of our contemporary technologies remain entirely invisible to us. Um, and I want to, you know, we can, we, can, we can track the edges of it. This is what I mean by invisible technologies. This is what I mean by the, the intangible things, the things that we don't see all around us. This is a bin um, in London. Um, they put these bins in about a year ago. Um, all around the city, around the business area in the centre of London. And they got very excited about them, God knows why, um, because they had these screens on them. They're, they're recycling bins with television screens on them. And this is supposed to be amazing. Because um, uh, brilliant, more ads. Um, I don't care. But, um, but it was a big thing. And, the, and they, they, had, you know, they, they are slightly connected. They had live travel data about the state of the underground on them and stuff like this. And it was kind of just more crap in the environment. But OK, that's the kind of thing that people do. Um, but um, the significance of this is as an invisible technology as well as when this thing suddenly becomes deeply interesting, but also completely intangible, is what was revealed just last week about these bins, um, is that they're spying on us, brilliantly. Um, uh, it turns out that the company that put in these bins fitted them with passive Wi-Fi sensors. Um, so that essentially they are, as you walk along, <laughs> I have set off an alarm. <laughs> this is good. They do something about that? <laughs> they don't want me talking about the bins, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you very much, people behind the curtain. Um, so, the thing is about these bins, as you walk past them, um, your phone, if you've got a smartphone, if you've got, or a laptop, or anything that uses Wi-Fi, it's constantly looking for Wi-Fi networks. And so it's sending out its MAC address, which is a unique ID for every single device. 
It's sending that out, and, and the Wi-Fi locations are pinging back to it and saying, yes, I'm here, you can connect to me. In this case, they're not. In this case, these objects, these bins, have devices inside them that just listen for that MAC address, and then they store it. Um, and, and it's basically like uh, web cookies in the real world. Um, Sort of, except it's not really like that as either. That's how people, the newspapers have been describing it, but it's not really like that because they leave no trace to us. Like, there's no way of knowing on your end that this thing has recorded you walking past it. Um, and so these, there's, there's about 100 of these bins around central London. There's only about 20 of them which had this put in, and they trialed it for about a week. And then they, the company released all the data and were like, look, look at this amazing thing we've done. And everyone went, excuse me, you've done what? <laughs> that is not cool. Um, and, um, and they're probably going to be banned. Um, so, like, I, it was all weird. It's, it's weird on multiple levels. It's weird that people do that and think it's okay. And that's, that's a whole subject around what people who work in technology or what technology allows us to do that des sometimes possibly sidesteps certain necessary ethical considerations. Um, it also speaks to like, the fact that we don't know what to do about it. Uh, and this is the bit where I get more worried. I actually went out last weekend and chalked all these bins with little signs um, like saying this thing is, is addressing you. But I didn't even know what to put on them. I started putting like eyes with little kind of Wi-Fi symbols and stuff like this, but we don't have a symbol for like this object is spying on you through an electromagnetic spectrum that you can't even see. Like that's not, we don't have a language for describing this. And, and, and I sort of worry that we're just gonna ban them rather than addressing this. Because if we ban it, then other companies will just do similar kind of things. They'll do work around and stuff. Rather than we work out how we talk about this thing. How we talk about this thing is important. How we understand these technologies uh, is key because because they infest the world. Um, they're entirely intertwined with it in all these ways. I'm going to talk about some of the ways they're intertwined. I'm going to talk about shopping and robots. Um, this is... Um, this is a factory, in, uh, or rather a warehouse in Pennsylvania. Um, these things on the bottom, uh, these little orange things, they're called Kiva robots. Um, they're one of the uh, more interesting types of uh, warehousing assistants uh, you can buy. It costs, it costs a few million dollars to install these little guys in your warehouse. But if you've got a big enough warehouse, they make a huge difference. Um, so what they do is, is they have their whole area of the warehouse over here, this central area, stacked with these... Um, these boxes, um, these, these stacks of shelves. And uh, when an order goes in, the little robots kind of, they scurry off and they, uh, you know, they go under one of these anxious shelving and they pick it up and they bring it to where there's some people at the side who are putting stuff into boxes. It's this nice little kind of collaborative thing. There's, but there's this brilliant um, interview, I think it was in Business Week or Wired or something, uh, where the reporter goes to the factory and uh, he meets the manager of the factory and they're walking through the factory. And, uh, and he says, and this is the kind of robot area. And the, and the, and the reporter says, notices that the guy's sort of checking as they walk along. And he's like, are we OK here? And he's like, yeah, yeah, they're, they're usually fine. They move quite fast, uh, <laughs> kind of like this. And he's sort of, but but it's, a, it's an area, a space, in which humans are kind of negotiating the rules of sharing space with automated systems, because we've physicalized them into these objects. These are instantiations of kind of packing and shipping processes. We've put them into little boxes and therefore we can kind of see them and we can interact with them. But the processes that they engender then kind of spread out further. Um, this, is, um, this is an Amazon warehouse in uh, Rugeley in Staffordshire uh, in England, Northern England. Um, it's built on the site of a former coal mine, um, which tells you quite a lot about the last 20 years of industrial history. Um, it's also, um, it doesn't use robots. It uses exclusively people. Um, but um, it uses people in a very interesting way um, because of the way Amazon has developed its warehousing and storages practices based on things like using robots. Um, and that is, uh, nothing in this warehouse is stored as a human would store it. Uh, Amazon uses a system called chaotic storage, which algorithmically analyzes um, the demand uh, for different 
uh, objects and the interrelated demands and the pairing of different things and then organizes its warehouses according to that. So if a human organized this space, you know, there would be the books over here from like by author A to Z, and then there'd be like the DVDs here, and then there'd be like the white goods here and stuff. No, that's not how warehouses like this work. That's deeply inefficient, um, because no one wants the books from A to Z. They want a book, and then they want a DVD and this. So you scatter it all over the place, um, which is great, hugely more efficient, although it means this space is totally unnavigable to a human being. Like you would not be able to find anything in this space on your own at all, right? which means the people who work in it um, use devices that tell them constantly where they need to go for the next thing. They, they, it requires a technological mediation and augmentation in order to be able to navigate this space. Um, it's impossible to do so otherwise. Um, and that, that makes this space into what um, human geographers call a code space. Um, it's a really kind of fascinating, for me, really important concept, which is, um, and this is the core example, this is the kind of canonical example of a code space, uh, which is an airport kind of departures area, a space most of us are kind of reasonably familiar with. And we're familiar with it and we know how to interact with it, which is that you, um, you, know, you arrive, you present your credentials, they are entered into a system, you are hopefully given permission to proceed, uh, and you kind of move through this space and onwards. Um, but... Um, if you've ever been in an airport when the system's gone down, uh, you know quite how catastrophic that is. Um, it's not just you know, the, the immediate system that fails, it's, it's the entire architecture. This, this ceases to be a, a kind of you know, modern, contemporary, um, functioning traveler experience. It turns into a big shed full of angry people. Um, kind of everything fails. Um, because this, what, what's really being done here isn't just like keeping the, roof, the rain off your head, it's, it's, it's processing everything through. This space is co-produced by architecture and software. It's what makes it a coded space uh, in this kind of geographical term. Coded spaces, it turns out, are kind of everywhere. Um, uh, you know, it's largely used in this kind of architectural geographical theory, so they talk about spaces like this or the warehouses, but for me, the, the concept of a coded space is, is far more widely applicable than that. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. This is a picture of the ENIAC. It was one of the first computers. Um, it was built at um, the University of um, Pennsylvania between 1942 and 1946. Um, uh, you know, it was one of those proper old mainframe things, you know, a couple of rooms filled with valves and wires and all this kind of thing. There's this beautiful quote from a guy who worked there, a mathematician called Harry Price. Um, sorry, Harry Reid. Um, Harry, sa Harry Reid said that... Um, the ENIAC was strangely a, a very personal computer. Uh, now we think of a personal computer as something that you carry around with yourself. The ENIAC was a computer that you lived inside. Because um, it was, it was kind of a couple of room size and you had to um, kind of burrow your way through it and explore it. Um, the ENIAC was one of the first computers. Computation is now everywhere. It is layered over everything and we are living inside that computer as well. Um, the, the, the internet stretches kind of entirely around the surface of the planet. Um, the functions of computation are carried out both locally and kind of globally in this thing that we call the cloud, which is actually, you know, like massive sheds full of more computers. Um, and, and it extends all the way up to kind of these satellites. This is the GPS network. Um, that every time you use Google Maps on your phone, you're talking to satellites 20,000 kilometers up in space. That is a, a vast infrastructure, a superstructure of computation that we are all now kind of living inside. Um, it's a structure, but not one that we can understand in kind of purely physical dimensions. And so we have to look at where that, that code space extends out, who it involves, and how it kind of crosses over things. Zoom back into those, those coded spaces, those coded workers. This is a, a terminal, um, a wearable computer of the type worn by... Um, the uh, employees of uh, the Amazon warehouse, or um, this is one actually I got from uh, uh, this is one used by Tesco, which is you know the UK's largest supermarket. Um, there was a, a thing last year where it turned out um, they were forcing all their warehouse workers in Dublin to wear these things, and then um, this this has a dual function. This machine because it um, it both gives them instructions on what they need to find and pack, uh, like the Amazon workers. It also monitors their break time and movements, um, so that you are constantly, we've kind of taken analytics and applying them you know, down, down to the human level now, monitoring when people take toilet breaks, monitoring how long their lunch breaks are. Um, uh, you know, the, the, um, 
this device allows for that greater efficiency and for a greater control. And there's a whole bunch of kind of labor aspects of this, um, not least that um, you know you can um, uh, far less training is required uh, to use you know these kind of things, which means you can apply uh, lower wage workers on shorter term contracts uh, or practically no contracts at all. Um, uh, you can employ people who don't necessarily have uh, English as first language. So there's less or whatever the local language is, uh, so there's less incentive to kind of educate people. Um, it lowers the barrier to work. It reduces people to kind of these processes. Um, it also atomizes them. You know, if, if you don't have short breaks, uh, if you don't have long breaks, if you're constantly on the move, if this thing is monitoring how far you walk around a warehouse, and in the case of Tesco, giving you points uh, or deducting them, de depending on that, you don't have time to stop and talk about unionizing. Um, it's a whole bunch of stuff. Those are direct kind of technological effects. Um, and that extends like back out to us again as well. These are remote control devices, you know. So if you've got a supermarket app on your phone, if you've got a shopping app or one of these kind of things, you know, you're part of that particular segment of the code space as well. You're remotely controlling those workers almost directly. There's an automatic link from you pressing that to like someone in a warehouse getting a command that sends them around this thing. We've automated that entire bit of the process. That entire thing has become intangible, and, and we're involved in it as well. Um, and it stretches back to the, to the manufacture of these objects as well. This is the kind of um, uh, the canonical image of, of the iPhone worker. This was a photo of an unknown Foxconn worker that was found on someone's iPhone when it was delivered. Uh, uh, it, and it's brilliant. It's wonderful. It's this kind of sudden glimpse into the, the kind of the blank, allegedly magical place from which all our, our, our extraordinary contemporary objects kind of emerge from. Um, so many of our contemporary objects kind of come with this, this sheen and patina of, 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 of magic. That's the word that iPhone things always use. It's not magic. It involves very large open cast mines, uh, a huge amount of trading, uh, very large factories in China, and people. Um, there are people involved in every kind of stage of this. And when you, you get links, li uh, little views into kind of stuff like this, these are the kind of the weak signals of a legible system. Um, technology is so tuned to make aspects like this invisible to us that they prevent it from being critical about it, essentially. Things like this are these tiny glimpses into, into that system that makes it possible, reminding us like, Harry Reid in the ENIAC, that there's always a person somewhere inside the box somewhere. We're involved as well. Um, this is the original person inside the box. Um, so anyone, how many people know what this is? It's out of interest. Um, this, is, this is the Mechanical Turk. Um, uh, the original Mechanical Turk, not Amazon's one, though there are interesting parallels. Uh, the original Mechanical Turk was an 18th century automaton. It was built by... Um, Wolfgang von Kempelen, who was a bit of an impresario, and he declared he'd made an automaton that could play chess. And uh, for about 40 years, uh, so this was a, a robot dressed up to look like a, a Turkish man um, that played very good chess. Uh, and it toured the courts of Europe uh, for kind of 40 years, wowing people, um, showing uh, this, this extraordinary wonder of the age. Of course, it was revealed after some time that there was always a person inside the box underneath. It was incredibly cleverly constructed. Uh, there's these panels on the front of it. Um, and inside, someone would sit on a little kind of sliding stool. And when one panel opened, their their, they would slide to one side, and some sort of clockwork panels would slide in and then slide back again. Um, and, uh, as bizarre as it seems, it evaded detection for for almost 40 years. Inside the box was a string of identifiable people, uh, usually aging chess masters, uh, usually drunk, uh, and usually broke. Uh, it's a really like sad line of, of people that were, that were stuck inside this thing for decades. Um, but I think what's, what's almost most interesting, well, so the, the Amazon Mechanical Turk as well, just for those who don't know it, is a, is a system by which you can upload um, tasks to Amazon, to the cloud, um, tasks which are easily broken down into smaller steps, things like tagging images or proofreading, copy editing, this kind of stuff, um, but specifically tasks which are actually quite hard for computers to do, very easy for people to do. Um, and the cloud that it gets distributed to is cheap humans. Um, it's, it's people all over the world who will do tiny, tiny tasks for very small amounts of money. 
that's what mechanical, Amazon's Mechanical Turk does. It takes that work and it splits it up. It puts the humans inside the box and lets you kind of address them computationally. It turns them into processes. Um, the thing that gets me about, about this Mechanical Turk is that, um, yeah, it turned out to be, um, to be a trick. It turned out to be a robot. Um, but it didn't really matter. Um, it still kind of entranced people. It still made them wonder. People's mental model of this uh, was, um, was kind of so powerful that it transformed their, their ideas of kind of what was possible. I think for me that stands for the fact that our perceptions of technology, our understanding of it, can often be as if not more important than the, actu than the, the true capabilities of the technology itself. Uh, if we're building this world, we build it on the basis of what we kind of think about how these things work, not necessarily how they do, certainly when it comes to things like politics. Um, but um, th there's, a, there's a brilliant moment that comes, I think, and that has come in certain areas, and that has come when we kind of start, stop competing with these technologies and we start collaborating with them. This is the um, very famous moment when uh, Deep Blue finally defeated Kasparov. Right? Um, this is a... a the moment when we finally go, like chess, this thing that we've built up as the kind of pinnacle of human intellectual achievement, computers are better than us. Bollocks. Um, like, we, 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 we've got there. Um, and, and for a while, chess was in this kind of horrible mental collapse of just like, well, we're screwed, we're done. Like, let, let's just wait for the cyborg overlords. And then interesting things started happening. If you look at um, computer chess now, the really interesting chess, chess is still not like a, a solved problem in computational terms. The really interesting work that's happening is actually around uh, what's called Centaur configuration chess, which is where um, uh, it's teams of humans and computers playing against each other, um, because it turns out while the best computer will now completely wipe the floor with even our best grandmasters. Uh, a human collaborating with a computer will wipe the floor with a far more advanced computer because there's complementary strategies at play here. Um, I, th I think that's a, that's a model to kind of think about all the time, but it's, it's interesting to watch how these technologies are infiltrating particularly sport because of the, because of the strange debates they raise. Um, Many of you have probably seen this system in, uh, in various forms, in various sports, depending on what you're interested in. Hawkeye, it's called. Um, it's used a lot in tennis, so you might have seen it there. Um, uh, it's a system that, mo uh, that models, based on a number of cameras, uh, the, the position of the ball um, in the sport and predicts where it's going to, where it's going to land. Um, and so it you know, decides whether the ball is in or out. Boom. Um, the thing about this, that I think is, is fascinating, is that it's not real, right? Um, like, it's, it's a prediction. This is, this is an algorithmic process that looks at the path of the ball and says where it will be. Uh, when it's close, when you see that little shadow of the ball on the ground, that's not real. That's what the computer thinks has probably happened. It's, more, it's probably more accurate at doing that than a human is, but it's not perfect. It has this kind of aura of or of, of doing right because it's a technology, but, not, you know, but it's not the same thing as truth, and that's important. Um, so Hawkeye was actually pioneered for cricket, um, which is a deeply silly sport, um, but quite a lot of fun if you're into it. Um, uh, and, and cricket's even, even more ridiculous in this regard because um, the major things it's predicting are things like this, uh, which is even though the ball hit the batter, if he hadn't been there, would it have hit the stumps behind him? And it turns out there's a huge amount of variation in that. Um, but, um, but it's important to work out. And there's this, you know, this has been going on within cricket for a few years now. This whole system was designed to solve this ridiculous Victorian problem that we invented because of this ridiculous sport. Um, and t cricket, weirdly, as one of like, the oldest and most ridiculous and formal of sports, has got incredibly high tech. It's kind of brilliant. So in addition to Hawkeye, which is an incredibly complex vision sensing system based on military um, image recognition technology, um, they now also use um, uh, infrared cameras. Uh, so this is to check whether the batsman actually touched the ball. Uh, and they use that by seeing if there's a momentary infrared hotspot on the ball. The system's actually called hotspot. Again, this is a camera that was developed for military night vision that's now being used to decide the sporting thing. They have another thing called snickometer, which is a tiny high-frequency microphone hidden inside the stumps, which listens for the little click as the batsman hits it. Um, the whole thing is wired. You're looking out at this field of men dressed in white and looking serious and lovely green grass and an English summer's day, and you're looking at this sensor grid 
this kind of really intensely surveilled computational space, which to me is kind of extraordinary. The weird sideshow of this is therefore discussions which aren't happening anywhere else are happening up here with blokes like this. Um, this is Henry Blofeld, who's an English cricket commentator. Um, he's, depending on taste, either hilarious or awful. Um, he's, he's in his 70s, at least. Um, he's been commenting on this for years. Uh, he's incredibly posh. He's like the most English person you can imagine. Um, and yet him and his colleagues in the commentary box are having what to me sounds like one of the most advanced and nuanced debates currently happening in public about the extent of human versus technological agency. Because they're talking about a system that's embedded in the world, in a set of rules that we've come to understand, that's visible, that's become concretized. Things like the, you know, the Amazon warehouses and so on and so forth, no one, no one sees those spaces. No one in those spaces has the power to articulate them. Uh, and we have no critical discourse for describing them. When we put them into sport, suddenly this whole debate becomes visible. Visibility is like incredibly key to this. We have to make these things visible, and then we have to embed them in systems so that they become legible, so that we can talk about it. I think it's brilliant, bizarre, but brilliant, that there's this kind of incredibly deep conversation about the philosophy of kind of human technological future happening on Test Match Special. Um, it, you know, it concerns me that once again, it's a bunch of old white dudes doing it, like, and not artists and engineers and uh, technologists and politicians and a whole bunch of other people who should be having this debate, who can affect change in it. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a thing we need to, need to remedy. Um, it's happening. Uh, the, the, the sport thing is getting wider and wider. This is the last sports slide, I promise. Um, uh, because they just started to introduce it into football. So that's suddenly taking this debate to a far wider audience. So there's goal line technology now. They, they've decided in the English Premier League to use Hawkeye, same as cricket and tennis, to decide when the ball has crossed the line. And the, and the referee wears a little watch that says goal in big letters when it goes across. So that's good. We, like, I can't really argue about it in, in football, except people can. There's a written introduction to football has raised a whole kind of extended that debate much further. Um, Particularly in the person of this man, who I like to think is kind of the last human crusader against the robot overlords. It's Seth Blatter, the uh, head of FIFA, um, who has fought a long campaign against um, goal line technology being introduced into football. Because in his position, his view, um, the referee is part of the game, right? Um, if the referee makes a mistake, that's because sport is a human endeavor and subject to human fallibilities. Um, and you can be as upset about it as you like. But that is the nature of, of humanity, of life, of the world, all of that. And Blatter's strongly held belief is that that should be maintained. Um, that those things shouldn't be engineered and augmented out. Um, and this is, this is a debate that we need to be having all over. Uh, it's a debate that applies to the politics and the shops again. Um, you know, do we augment, augment, augment because it's, because it's capable, because it makes for greater efficiency? Or do we maybe think about human fallibility and frailty and so on and so forth? It's weird that it's being done by Sepp Blatter, but it is. Um, the other thing that, that happened to Sepp Blatter, and this is the link that I make, um, you might have seen this a while back, uh, Sepp Blatter's Twitter feed got hijacked um, by the Syrian Electronic Army. Um, the Syrian Electronic Army are a hacker group um, who appear to be uh, on, on the side of, the, uh, um, of Bashar al-Assad. Um, in the Syrian conflict against the rebels. And they, they've been going around, they hijack all kinds of weird Twitter accounts and leave strange messages. Um, they claimed Sepp Blatter was um, uh, uh, resigning. And, and I like this. This is the kind of the robot hacker army rising up in, into this kind of battle with, with Sepp Blatter. They should have known that possibly he was a supporter of theirs. Um, but it, it digs into kind of one of the many ways in which these different worlds, the retail, the shopping, the warfare, they all, they all lap over because of the because of the technologies involved. Um, this is a picture of Eric Schmidt, who's the chairman of Google. Um, this is his Twitter avatar, in fact. Um, it's a weird one. He's wearing a flak jacket, um, which sort of bothered me when I first noted it. Um, I was like, that's a weird way to present yourself. Um, that seems like of some kind of significance. Why would you be doing that? Uh, it turns out, as far as I've been able to establish, that this photo was taken on a, um, a trip to Iraq in 2009, um, Schmidt promised to uh, digitize the entire contents of what was then left of the um, 
of the National Museum in Baghdad. If you remember, the National Museum was vandalized and looted really heavily after the, um, after the invasion. Um, but um, Google's now promised that it's going to do something about this. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't yet. Um, I applaud any effort to kind of preserve cultural objects. Uh, I remain deeply concerned about that being done by private companies who may or may not have a, an interest in this stuff. Um, but it turns out that Google's involvement in kind of contemporary warfare is, is rather deeper than, than simply um, uh, uh, protecting cultural treasures. Um, at a conference I was at recently, uh, Schmidt was talking about his new book, and he, he, he said some crazy things. Um, he basically gave a long talk in which he presented technology as a, as a neutral good essentially, as something that could be kind of rolled out and that would be of benefit to everyone and would be a good thing without really kind of any, any qualms, any, any, any worries about this, that, that you could just give people technologies and it would make stuff better. Um, the, the rather terrifying he got, example he gave of this, um, uh, and this is a direct quote, was that if everyone in Rwanda had had, geno uh, had, had cell phones, there wouldn't have been a genocide. Um, which is you know, not only terrifying, but just straight up wrong. Um, th but it's this idea that purely making visible, that by kind of broadcasting, by allowing people to see things, we, we can change them. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ethos that extends kind of through all our kind of forms of contemporary social media and so on and so forth. It's also the same ethos that governments have when they surveil. By, by making visible, by seeing, we can kind of act. Um, Google's actually heavily involved in international politics. Uh, they lobby heavy at politics. They have a think tank called Google Ideas, uh, which has been providing technological assistance to, in this particular case, the, um, the rebels in Syria. Google is picking sides in wars, um, which, is, which is an interesting thing, particularly if you also think how many governments use Gmail, use Google Docs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this idea that kind of by making something visible, we can affect it is all very well, but it's not true. Um, these are images from Google-owned satellites, uh, or part, satellites owned by Digital Globe, part owned by Google. This is the, um, the digging and filling in of a mass grave in Daria in Syria um, a, few, uh, a couple of months ago. Images captured from space. We have access to this imagery. Uh, it doesn't allow us necessarily to do anything about it. Uh, we should question who, who's, who's operating these things, who's providing them, where they're going. And try and make these things visible. This is a project of mine called Dronestagram. Um, Dronestagram takes um, records uh, created by journalists, collate information about uh, drone strikes, uh, particularly the kind of CIA drone strikes in Pakistan, the Yemen, um, ones outside the purview of declared wars. Um, and then it tries to find the landscapes of those places on Google Maps. These aren't, you know, this isn't the exact location because the exact locations are basically unknown. Uh, it should be within kind of 10, 20 kilometers, I think. Um, but I go and find these locations on Google Maps and I post them back to, um, to Instagram. Um, because that's where you go to get your kind of daily dose of reality, right? That's where you go to kind of see through other people's eyes. That's what our social medias are supposed to be doing, kind of bringing us together, giving us this empathy. We develop these technologies that allow us to see through satellites to be able to take out your mobile phone and, and look through, and we've already become kind of bored with it. It's already banal. We use it for like finding the local shop or a restaurant for dinner. We've given ourselves this kind of all-seeing God power, and we kind of use it for you know, very small things. Um, there's this kind of break between the uses of technology as, as we use them socially, for business, and so on and so forth, and their capabilities in the world, uh, which I think are, are far greater than anything we, we're currently doing with them. Um, and I think that's a... Again, a problem of communication, it's a problem of debate, it's a problem of how we're articulating this stuff. Um, it was strange that when I first started this project, it got an interesting, quite strong media reaction. Um, it was covered on kind of lots of, lots of press, um, starting with the tech press, because obviously it's, a, it's Instagram, right? So it's a social media story. But it kind of expanded a bit beyond that. But I got this really deep sense of the, the total inability of our media to have any kind of meaningful discussion about technology um, because they simply didn't have the words or the, the concepts for dealing it. They didn't know what Instagram is. They don't know what the devices are. They don't know how these images are gathered by satellites. They have no technological understanding. Um, and these are the people who are supposed to be, hopefully, helping us navigate this world. Um, we, need, we need better alternatives to that. Um, but even if, you know, whether it's coverage of this, it's that thing when, when anything you actually know about is in the news 
and you realize that they know nothing. It's very terrifying. Uh, but it extends not just to things you know about, to kind of everything, including lots of more stuff around the Syrian conflict. Uh, this is from Danish television. Um, this was a report on the situation in Damascus a couple of months ago. Uh, the image in the background is from Assassin's Creed. Um, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not the real Damascus. Um, likewise, uh, this is from BBC News. Uh, this is another report on Syria. Um, this was a piece about uh, Amnesty International and the UN Security Council's uh, debates that they were having about the action that should be taken in Syria. That's the logo of the United Nations Space Command from Halo. Um, uh, I, assuming both of these are kind of intern Google image related uh, mistakes, but you start to see this sort of thing happening all around. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, although it's good. I'm going to talk about this. Um, I think I've got five minutes, right? All right. Uh, let's go back to Syria again quickly. Well, I was still in Syria. This is a, this is a tank uh, built um, by, by Syrian rebels uh, by, from plans they built on the internet. This is how it's controlled on the inside. Um, using the mechanics and, and technologies of a first player shooter to, um, to, uh, to run this thing. Um, this is an intensely technologically augmented conflict that's going on at the moment. This is a homemade catapult being used in the suburbs of um, Damascus by rebels. But the significant thing is what's going on here. This guy's filming it. Um, because the Syrian conflict is one that's being run almost entirely on YouTube. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's because funding is coming from other Gulf states to set up uh, rebel groups and, and buy arms for them. And in order to prove that that money is being well spent, uh, they're asked to video it and put it back onto YouTube again. Um, the result of this is, is more strange effects like this one. This is a guy called Elliot Higgins, who's a British man um, who's become an expert in the weapons flows around the Syrian conflict because he's watching those YouTube videos and he's seeing the weapons that are being used by the rebels and he's tracking back to where they come from. So his work on analyzing the weapons flows around the conflict, which he sees only through YouTube, is being cited in United Nations and humanitarian reports. This is an opportunity of using those same technologies to, to read back into the conflict again, uh, to be able to say, this is a deeply complex system, a d one that's incredibly hard to read, um, but, um, but by understanding some of the mechanics of it, understanding some of the flows, you can start to see the edges of it. Technology is, in all of these cases, it's, it's not a neutral good, it's a tool, right? It's technology is the concretization, the instantiation of human politics and desires. Um, it's deep and it's complex and it's hard to see the edges of it, but if you start to see a complete pattern, you can kind of render it legible. Um, and that's the thing, that's what, that's what I was concerned about. I was concerned that this stuff was so invisible, so illegible, that there was no chance of us getting a handle on it, uh, that it would remain always out of sight. But what I realized through examples like the Higgins thing, for I, by just doing the research, by paying attention, by looking at this stuff, technology actually, conversely, also renders things visible. Because in order to make something into a technology, you have to write it down, right? You have to code it. You have to type the thing in. And at some level, that makes it readable. That makes it approachable and understandable. The title of this talk you may have seen at the beginning was Naked Lunch which is the quote from William Burroughs, and the definition of the naked lunch is the moment when everybody sees what is at the end of every fork, the moment of total clarity. And so while technology is making stuff more complex and more invisible and often illegible, it's also forcing it into view. The things we were talking about yesterday, if you were at the extraordinary se session on online harassment, of which there's an explosion of attention from. That's not something that's just happened because of the internet. It's something that's been there kind of latent in our societies for so long, but it's made so powerfully visible. And we have this moment in which we can actually maybe do something about it. That applies to all of these issues. Um, it's our responsibility to build tools that render these things legible, to pay attention enough to them, and to become uh, literate in them ourselves so that we can, we can do something useful with them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. I, we're not going to have time for a lot of questions. I just want to say it's such an honor 
to be in the presence, I think, of all of these speakers and be allowed to engage with all of these thoughts. We're so grateful. Thank you. I have an immediate follow-up question, mm -hmm. just terminology. I do realize this is a consequence of belonging to a specific generation and, and being interested in these things, but yeah. twice you used the terms robot overlords and cyborg overlords. It's yeah. sort of shorthand for a, a technologically uh, dangerous future. It, I am not sure from this talk where you stand on th that. Do you in fact fear, uh, not the robot overlords obviously, but do you fear the technologies uh, that we're making now? No, I don't fear the technologies that we're making. I fear some of the uses to which they're put. Um, I, I happily bandly around terms like robot overlords and robot cyborgs because it's a useful shorthand for those things, as you said. Um, but, uh, but let's always bear in mind that all of this stuff is metaphors. It's all metaphors for uh, objects, for computers, for people typing into those computers. Um, and what we actually need really badly are better metaphors. All our, all our current ones for this stuff are just deeply broken and they're not, they're not useful anymore. Okay, because we don't have time, I'm just, just now going to make an executive decision, which is I'm going to ask one more question. Okay. And you, you will be around yeah, for the right. day and maybe even tomorrow. So, so you, can, you can catch James and talk more about this and talk to each other about this as well. So then I think that the one question that we have time for is this. We need better words. Where do we start? If we go back to, to the micro-actions of, of Sandy Gallup yesterday, what's the one micro-action we can take with us from I, this? I'm sorry, to work? but I'm not going to do that. I, this is not a game for micro-actions. It's a game for macro-actions. Okay. It's, it's a game for bigger understanding. There's no like one little thing here. Okay, so then in that case, where do we start? Where's the door or the first page? The, 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 door, uh, the door is asking questions. The door is having the debate. The door is when presented with images that seem complex to so when presented with when we're presented with for example the example of the last slide something like the NSA spying um, revelations which is a vast and complex and systematic thing ask questions about it not to get carried away in the kind of soap opera of what's happening to Edward Snowden or you know kind of what's happening on kind of individual levels but look at this structurally and ask how it's meant to be understood what we need to do is we need to develop a literacy in systems Systems literacy is the literacy of the 21st century. It's the most important one, and that's a, it's a long battle. Um, immediately, just start asking questions and asking how and why these things have come about rather than just what happened. But we are, I think, I mean, as you say, this is the whole world that we live in is physically encircled by these, by these systems, and we are not currently within a paradigm or a terminology or understanding where we can break that down into coherent things. You seem to be ahead of the curve mm -hmm. relative to most of us. Where did you start? Just by doing this, just by asking questions of those images. If I see a picture of Eric Schmidt wearing a flak jacket, I go, right, where was that taken? Why? How? Like, what's the background to this? Those what things are trackable. Mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. what does this mean? What are we doing with it? Um, it's possible. We have all of this information at our fingertips. Um, we, we just need to make use of it better. Thank you. Your book is coming out this fall. No, it's not. No, it's not? No. <laughs> Your No book. No book. I was, ho I was hoping. Then, then I'm sorry. Then it's the, then it's, I'm sorry. It's the speaker <laughs> this, after this afternoon. I was hopefully projecting that maybe you could write this I'll out. I'll get a book. I'll case, get a book out. No right, book. Right. A blog. I'm sorry. No. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Yeah.